I'm Dr. Brent Spencer, professor of English and director of the new Master of Fine Arts program in Creative Writing, which has just begun this year at the university. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this special lecture. Thank you for coming, for being here, making the time. We're very pleased to welcome our special guest, Ron Hansen, who is a distinguished writer, an Omaha native, and a Creighton University alum. We're going to learn more about him and hear from him shortly. Before we get started, let me remind you to please silence your electronic devices. I just did mine. <laughs> And to begin our program, I'd like to ask Gregory Carlson of the Society of Jesus to offer the invocation prayer. With those devices silent, maybe we can let ourselves grow silent for a moment. God of us all, our priest poet plays with words and tells us that Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs, and lovely in eyes not his. And we might add, lovely in works of art, whether of words, sounds, colors, forms, movements. Over again we feel your finger and find you. You touch us afresh, not least where creative human beings make works that challenge, refresh, inspire, provoke. Help our new program, we ask, to play well, to make well, to learn well. Help us to find you afresh tonight in ourselves, in our world, and in the words of your lovely player, Ron Hansen. We pray in the name of Jesus and all our brothers and sisters who revere you as the great artist of our world. And let the people say amen. amen. And let the people say amen. amen. Before our speaker is introduced, I'd like to recognize in our audience the family of Ron Hansen who are present. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, please stand up to be recognized. With us tonight, Ron's sister Alice, sister-in-law Marilyn, uh, Ron's niece Rebecca, and her husband Byers Shaw. Right, please. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I also wish to recognize in our audience Creighton Prep's new president, Mr. Jambaluka. Where are you? Right here, thank you. And also uh, the university's vice presidents, deans, and members of the Jesuit community. If you would all please stand to be recognized. Thanks so much. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the sponsors for tonight's event, the Dean's Office of the College of Arts and Sciences, the Graduate School, the Department of English, and the Creighton chapters of Alpha Sigma Nu and Phi Beta Kappa. We're deeply grateful for the support. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can't think of a better way to celebrate Creighton's new Master of Fine Arts program in creative writing than with tonight's special guest. And if you're asking what MFA program, uh, well, to learn more about it, on your way out tonight, you may find these brochures in the foyer, grab one, or you may visit online the website, thewritersedge.org, not .com, O-R-G, um, and you'll find out everything about it. We think we have one of the most innovative MFA programs really anywhere, and um, we don't have time right here and now to uh, go through the many unique features, but um, they're there, and I'd love to talk with anyone about it if you'd like. Um, Tonight's guest is a man I've known for many years, a man I've envied for much longer. <laughs> I'm grateful for the chance to appear before you in order to say that though he may be a much honored and much loved son of Nebraska, 
and a writer of enormous gifts, and a Creighton alum extraordinaire, I'm here to tell you tonight that Ron Hansen must be stopped. <laughs> now, 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 oh, please, please, hear me out. First of all, there are many parallels between us. Ron is an Omaha native. I live in Omaha. Ron is a graduate of Creighton University. I teach at Creighton University. Ron, like me, is a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop and the Stanford Creative Writing Program. One of Ron's novels was made into a movie starring Brad Pitt and Casey Affleck. I saw that movie. <laughs> Ron's the award-winning, best-selling author of many highly acclaimed books, and I'm, I, well, I may already be a winner in the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. <laughs> you see the problem. It isn't fair. <laughs> Let me make myself crystal clear. Like Dr. Van Helsing in Bram Stoker's novel Dracula, I have made it my goal in life, my purpose, my raison d'etre, my idée fixe to stop Ron Hansen. <laughs> and I am grateful for your support. <laughs> Certainly, his prose is richly textured, his characters full of life and the Dickens, his insights thoughtful and penetrating, and yes, he has a chameleon-like ability to inhabit the lives of people as various as Jesse James, a young novitiate, a grieving father, a young wife with murder on her mind, five shipwrecked nuns, Gerard Manley Hopkins, and even Adolf Hitler. I give you that. And yes, he's the highly acclaimed author of many books, including Desperados, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford, Mariette in Ecstasy, Atticus, Hitler's Niece, Exiles, and his most recent, the novel A Wild Surge of Guilty Passion, and the short story collection She Loves Me Not, which includes stories from his award-winning collection Nebraska and several news stories. And yes, he's received awards past counting, including the award in literature from the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship. He's been a finalist for the National Book Award and for the Penn Faulkner Award. And I can't overlook his award-winning children's book, The Shadow Maker, or his book of essays on fiction and faith, A Stay Against Confusion. And let's not forget his many magazine publications. I'm crying on the inside <laughs> as I read these things. His screenplays, his poetry even, his faculty appointment as Gerard Manley Hopkins SJ Professor in the Arts and Humanities at Santa Clara University, not to mention his beautiful and talented wife and family. Have I made myself understood? <laughs> Have I adequately described the nature of his enormity, of his crimes against writers and writing everywhere, but especially his crimes against me? <laughs> he, he, he's too good. He's too successful. It's not fair. He does it all, and he does it all too well. I beg you. I plead with you. Please help me. I can't do it without you. Stop this man before he writes again. <laughs> before he uses up all the good words, all the good stories, and leaves no crumbs on the table for the rest of us lowly scribblers for me. Don't encourage him. Yes, his books are available at moderate prices for purchase in the foyer after the reading. Yes, he's more than happy to sign your copies and to chat with you, but do not buy his books, which I repeat are conveniently and abundantly located in the foyer. Do not read him or recommend him to your friends. Do not swoon at his vivid prose, his deft characterization, his inventive plots, his stunning insights. Resist. Maybe you've heard of the Hanta virus. This is the Hansen virus. <laughs> and it has swept across our great nation for far too long. Critics have described his various books as laugh out loud funny, a literary tour de force, brilliant, chilling, they say he writes with breathtaking virtuosity, that he writes to inspire awe, that he writes with quiet beauty, that he is an awesomely gifted writer, and yada, yada, yada. Oh, my people, can't you see? 
It's time to stop his literary reign of terror. And in case I haven't made my point clear enough, what I mean to say is this. I hate him. I hate him. I, oh, how I hate him. Because a lot of other writers, fine writers, excellent writers, oh, okay, me, <laughs> moi, I, have had to eat his dust and live in his shadow for too long a time now. This man must be stopped. I take solace from the fact that last night I heard Ron sing a little of Ave Maria. <laughs> Friends, I'm here to tell you that there are limits to this man's prodigious <laughs> talents. For most of the night, I'd sat quietly in a dark closet waiting for my ears to stop bleeding. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm kidding, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Ron Hansen believes that creative writing can be viewed, quote, viewed as a sacrament insofar as it provides graced occasions of encounter between humanity and God. I've never heard it put so well. And by the way, my dean will never hear it put so well when I add those words to my year-end report, <laughs> perhaps with a credit to Ron, perhaps not. <laughs> but seriously, as they say, one might think that a fiction so deeply informed by faith would be reductive, even prescriptive. But Ron doesn't explain the mystery at the heart of creation. He's not the kind of writer poet Ezra Pound decried as the village explainer. Like every true artist, he honors the mystery by explaining the thing next to it. True vision always takes the form of storytelling, as a simple carpenter once demonstrated so well. It brings with it a reverence for mystery and metaphor, for literature and for light. Reading Ron Hansen's work, we're reminded that words matter, that our stories matter, which is why it is really so appropriate that Ron should be here to help us kick off our new Master of Fine Arts program in creative writing. Ron is right. The act of writing, of creating a poem, a story, a novel, etc., is a sacrament because the right words can save a life. So I have only one question for you. Are you with me? <laughs> with your support, we can eradicate Ron Hansen in our lifetime and make way for some equally talented writers. <laughs> but who am I kidding? I, I look out and I see all those smiling faces. I can see it's already too late that you've all been infected by the Hansen virus, it's clear to me that while life and breath endure, Ron Hansen will never stop writing, and his readers will never stop reading him. And to be honest, though I would never admit it in public, much less to his face, I have to confess that perhaps my remarks here tonight have been inspired by the mildest twinge, the littlest speck, the merest morsel of what you might call jealousy. Thus, though it pains me to say it, please welcome my prodigiously talented friend, Ron Hansen. Thank you very much. Brent has introduced me uh, several times in the past, and I'm always appalled by what he says. <laughs> I hear, that's really wonderful, Brent. Thank you. And just a second, it, uh, the MFA program here is remarkable. It's, uh, I think it's one that's going to sweep the nation eventually. It's, it's got so much energy, and uh, it's so unique, as Brent has said. So I hope if any of you are considering an MFA program that you'll think of uh, Creighton. And I, I want to say, too, how Creighton is so much better than when I was here <laughs> that it makes me feel smarter for having gone here. <laughs> These beautiful buildings, great faculty, uh, wonderful students, that they're all um, enviable. I'm going to read uh, three pieces from my collection, She Loves Me Not. Uh, the first is in honor of my brother-in-law, Bill Rodert, and this is what you call a found story because my sister Alice uh, related it to me at one time, and I thought immediately that was a story. It's very short. It's called The Sleepwalker. It's on page 213. Um, the Sleepwalker. She watches his slow decline as she would a fire at home on restful evenings. 
opera softly emanating from the stereo in another room, perhaps a glass of cool Pinot Noir at hand, and he patiently staring at nothing at all, lost in thoughtlessness, as silent as smoke, as the flames eat away at the charred wood, feasting on all good of it. He was once so many people, a hardy farm boy, wild seaman, a cook on a Portuguese fishing boat, a roughneck on oil wells, then an oil driller himself, an inventor, a father, the owner of restaurants and farmland and commercial properties, yet ever laughing and lovable and in awe of learning, and now and learning more with each week. Reminded of his accomplishments, he smiled and said, I did that? Well, I'll be goddamned. And now he is a wanderer, bewildered by unfamiliar rooms, finding his way outdoors in raw weather without a coat, and needing neighbors to guide him back to an address he can't recall. And a toddler, too, forgetting etiquette, getting into mischief, eating ice cream for breakfast with his four-year-old granddaughter, who tells him he can, who gives him permission. The loneliness is the hardest part, the memories that she can no longer share with any meaning, or saying things of importance and realizing they will not be recalled, and fearing the probable time to come when she will be feared, a wife to a man for whom husbanding has ended. She's becoming increasingly a stranger, invading his littler portion of certainty. Some nights she hears him walking from room to room, as if hunting his history, his mind, the hurly-burly life he's lost. She aches to think of what it must be like to be him, to be helpless, puzzled, surprised, infantile. Hundreds of faces without names, recognitions of him that he is not equal to. But he finds his wife sleeping on the frilly daybed in the feminine sunroom at the front of the house. And he looms over her like his old self. And in the sentience of that night, he says in his sudden and momentary wakefulness, I know how hard all of this is for you, and I appreciate what you're doing. Then he retreats into the hallway and back into his illness. But those st words stay with her and are enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad uh, Father Dick Hauser was here earlier uh, because uh, this story, The Sparrow, was inspired by his book, Finding, Tri Finding God in Troubled Times. Uh, in there, he detailed the various responses to death. And so I decided to write a story that would kind of detail that as well. And a lot of these are based on perma permanent exper experiences of mine. Um, uh, and I, this is an Omaha story, so I thought it fitting. The Sparrow. She had been flying a Cessna, shooting practice takeoffs and landings with a flight instructor at an Omaha airstrip that was just a windsock and one lane of unnumbered concrete runway veined with tar repairs. Richard Nixon was president. The month was September. The temperature was 60 degrees. And she was Karen Mannion, mother of two. The flying, instruct, instruct, the flying lessons were for a gift from her husband for her 40th birthday. The flight instructor was a gruff, retired warrant officer named Billy, who claimed he'd flown everything the Army had, from fixed wings to Chinooks. Within a week, Karen would take the flight test to get her private pilot's license. And she told her husband a night earlier that Billy was trying to prepare her for it by pulling stunts that some examiners were known to do, hiding flight plans and cross-country maps, or forcing the plane too steep in its climb so that the horn warned of a stall. Yesterday, Billy had watched Karen's face with, face with a confident smile as she recovered from a hammerhead spin. And now, as she ran the Cessna up to 65 miles per hour, eased back on the yoke, and felt the plane lift up from the runway, the front window would have been filled with skies that were the blue of old jeans, nothing more. And she probably glanced at the vertical speed and turn and bank indicators, 
before she noticed that Billy's hand was on the plunger throttle and suddenly jerking it back, cutting the power. Karen was supposed to immediately push down the nose to maintain airspeed, but she may have glared with shock and insult at Billy or screamed a question about what he thought he was doing. And in that hesitation, the Cessna fell 40 or 50 feet. The stall horn would have blared, and Billy would have plunged for the control yoke as he hurriedly said, I've got it, giving the plane full throttle as he tilted the nose down. But they'd fallen too far, and they would have seen skid marks on concrete rushing up into the front window fast as the Cessna crashed into the runway very hard. Karen's son, Aiden, was 12 years old, and he was at home hitting a shag bag of golf balls into a peach basket with his father's chrome bright sandwich when he heard the kitchen telephone and ran inside to answer it. Oh, Aiden, Kelly, their neighbor said, not sounding right. She paused and with some strain asked, is Lucy there? Lucy was 15, his older sister. So he first thought his mother's friend was hunting a babysitter. She's at a friend's house, he said. Kelly seemed to be crying. A hand seemed to clench her throat. Would you go get her, honey? And then I'll come get you both. Why? She told him there had been an accident and his mother was at a manual, nothing more. Aiden found Lucy four houses down the street. She and Molly were lying on the floor of the yellow living room, Lucy's head pillowed by Molly's stomach as she read aloud from Dylan Thomas's Adventures in the Skin Trade. Wildly giggling at the prose, Lucy tried to go on, but Molly's, Molly's stomach bulged with laughter too, and Yuli, Lucy yelled in pretend anger, you're jiggling the pages. Molly guffawed, rolling away and holding her waist with both cro crossed arms and Lucy caught sight of Aiden in his loneliness of grief. She got up on an elbow and she quieted as she stared. What's happened? Mom's hurt, Aiden said. Kelly drove them to a manual hospital. She told them her father had been contacted at work and that he was already there when he phoned her. The flight instructor had been killed in the accident. His name was Billy, Aiden said. Kelly looked at him in the rearview mirror and said, Billy, thank you. She tried to give them further information, but she ran out quickly. There was too much she'd only be guessing at. And so she just held on to the steering wheel tightly as she raced through yellow lights. Aiden sat in the back seat, mutely watching as tears trickled down Kelly's cheek and she wiped them with her palm. She blurted an embarrassed laugh as she said, I'm such a rock. Lucy reached across and gave a sisterly touch to her hand. That's okay. Kelly was driving them through a cathedral of shade made by stately elm trees. Aiden looked outside at a boy half his age wobbling down the sidewalk on a bicycle too big for him. And there on a porch, a mother was watching too, a hand to her mouth, imprisoning her warnings. But still, the boy did not fall. At a manual, a nurse told Aiden and Lucy that their father had gotten there in time to accompany the gurney as their mother was rushed upstairs into surgery. Mrs. Mannion was in a coma. The head and chest wounds were traumatic. Kelly went down the hallway to the banks of telephones and Aiden and Lucy sat next to each other on hard plastic chairs in the uncoziness of the waiting area, saying nothing, staring at the floor. Aiden's thoughts were discontinuous, furious, forlorn, like a child's Crayola scribble on the wall. And when he heard Lucy whisper, are you praying? He felt convicted. Uh-huh, he said. Me too, Lucy said. And she surprised him by holding his hand in hers. She'll live, Lucy said. She's got to. He was shocked that he hadn't yet considered the fact that his mother could die from the injuries. With great urgency, Aiden silently recited the prayers he'd memorized in religion class, prayers he'd say hurriedly, his heart hammering, whenever he woke up from nightmare. But he was convinced more was expected now, some plea, some contract, a way of prevailing against the grim odds with earnest promises that he'd be good, 
say a rosary every day, even become a priest, if only God would let his mother live. Please, God, he prayed, don't let my mother die. I need her. And then they saw their father at the far end of the hallway, walking toward them in hospital scrubs with a friend who was an orthopedic surgeon. Aiden got up from his chair just as his sister did. But when he saw Lucy freeze and fail to run forward, he stayed as he was too. He took, his, it, took it as a good sign that there were no blood stains on either of the men, but he noticed their solemnity. Dr. Welster, Welter's stare drifted from Aiden's to the floor. When their father was a few feet away, he quietly said, Hi, kids. Lucy forgot her pretense of calm and flung herself into him, her face in his chest as she screeched her misery. Worn out, red-eyed, seemingly lost, Emmett Mannion held her and kissed her head as she wept, then petted her hair and said, Shh now, shh. Lucy screamed, I don't want to shh. I'm sad. Their father looked at Aiden and held out his left arm. Aiden fitted himself under it, and his father kissed his head too. The hospital scrubs smelled of medicines like a bathroom cabinet. The wingtip of his father's left shoe shone, shone with a coin of moisture. His strong chest swelled as he forced himself to inhale. She's gone, kids, he told them. Lucy fell to her knees on the floor and wailed. And Aiden, Aiden felt childish and empty and impossibly stupid. For he'd at first thought his father meant she'd gotten well and left the hospital. But he hadn't said dead, had, he'd said gone. Wouldn't he have said dead if she was dead? She wasn't, maybe. Kelly had found cold cans of Coca-Cola for them and was strolling toward them in the hallway. But Aiden saw her halt when she saw his father. His face must have communicated with a great deal of accuracy, for she sank into a chair and folded over and cried. The funeral was hard, but harder were the sentiments afterward as swarming people tried to console them. Either it was a touch of assurance and a side confession of mystery as in his ways are not our ways, as if with fathomless ulterior motives, God coldly intended the crash. Or they'd pat Lucy's or Aiden's hands while confiding in faith that much good would come of this, as if their mother's death was a lesson they would have not had learned otherwise. Classmates stood far away from them, hallowed and ill at ease, as if death was contagious. Even lofty, fearsome Monsignor, Monsignor Florio fell out of his character, his soft handshake holding fast to Emmett Mannion's as he instructed, St. Augustine wrote, non enim fecit atque abiit, meaning God did not just make us and go away. We have a personal relationship with him. Whatever happens to us, good or bad, it is equally as important to God. Aiden's father shamed his son by weakly answering, thank you, Monsignor, seeming no older than 12 himself. But hours later, he found Aiden in his room and a football in the crook of his arm. Emmett worked up a smile as he asked, how about throwing the oblate spheroid around? There was a competition over their father for a while. Kelly kept showing up with her little children in a casserole, a pan of fudge, a lasagna, and Lucy fumed, wordlessly ate, and after referred to Ke Kelly as the divorcee. Even in her embarrassment at vying for their father's attentions, Kelly would find a reason to stay around until Emmett got home and then they would drink Chardonnay and coats on the patio as Aiden whacked his wiffle ball against the garage door and Lucy played desultory games of Candyland inside with the children. But then there must have been an earnest nighttime conversation that Lucy and Aiden didn't hear. For with falls unleaving, Kelly stopped stopping by. Still, his, his sister cried for hours on end. Wherever she could in her room, Lucy hung old photographs of Karen from high school yearbooks, from the scrapbook Our Wedding, from the obituary in the Omaha World Herald. She researched her mother's injuries and hung up a framed poster on the anatomy of the brain. She reread her mother's handwritten sentiments on birthday cards she collected over the years 
and constructed a kind of shrine around a snapshot from her mother's 40th birthday party. The one where Karen Mannion smiled as she held up a small plastic Cessna airplane in her right hand, and in her left, a gift certificate, certificate for flying lessons. Wedged in a corner of the photograph was a slip of paper on which Lucy had written, I will not leave you orphaned, John 14, 18. Lucy lost weight. She forgot tests and homework, wouldn't answer Molly's phone calls. She confided in her father, shared errands with him, and flew into his embrace when he got home from work as if she'd been storing up those tears. She said she often dreamed about her mother and gladly reported the dreams at breakfast, but neither Aidan nor her father could invent the correct reply. Out of the blue, she told Aidan once, she wants you to sign up for sixth grade basketball. She says you'll be good at it. And then she wept and fell into him, and Aidan held her as his father did, patting her jerking back awkwardly, but not saying they're there. Their father was stoic about it, strong for them. Each Sunday evening, Emmett wrote out the week's schedules and chores, listed grocery store items, his obligations at work, things that still needed to be done. Everybody was very careful with each other and avoided any harsh words. They were responsible for their own laundry now, shared the dishwashing chores, and once there was a rigorous inspection of the rooms, but he forgot to continue most of the other programs he established. Aiden once wandered into the bedroom he still thought of as, as his mother's, though only his father slept there now. Nothing had changed since September. His mother's clothing still hung in the closet, a faint hint of her sweat in her gardening shirt, a faint trace of Chanel in a cocktail dress. And hair was still in her hairbrush. Her creams, conditioners, and cleansing lotions were like a cityscape on the mirrored counter in the master bathroom. Was that healthy, having her present like that? Lucy was continually emotional, but Aidan noticed his father's grief only once, when he woke up in the middle of the night and saw him out there in the late November cold of the backyard, coatless, facing nothing at all, and weeping so like a child that Aidan himself wept with, wept with him. Some friends from Emmett's office visited the house in December to toast his promotion. Each was introduced to the children, but Aiden remembered only the pretty secretary's name, Gail with a Y. His jealousy confused him. His father cooked ribeyes on the outdoor grill as fat snowflakes fluttered down and decomposed in the patio bricks. Everyone seemed too loud. Homework took Lucy and Aiden up to their rooms after dinner, but Aiden came out after an hour and crouched on the landing, his knees in a hug, to listen in on the conversation. Only Gail had stayed, and she was contrasting their father with her ex, lavishly praising Emmett, telling him how crucial he was to the company, what a pleasure it was to watch him succeed, and how much his friendship meant to her. Could he see how lonely she'd been? Aiden's father said nothing. And then she asked, are you aware I love you passionately? Geez, who talks like that, Aiden thought. Emmett flatly told her, yes, I know how you feel. Aiden held his hands over his ears as he got up to go back to his room. But then he saw his sister standing there behind him, listening to and far more interested than Aiden in whatever happened next. She chose to, chose to defend her father in advance, whispering to Aiden, he's human, you know. Aiden entered his room, shut the door, and just in case, tuned his radio between stations so he couldn't hear anything but a hissing, crackling noise like tires on their cindle, cinder alley. Half hour later, however, he rose above the white forest of frost on his window to see Gail hurrying to her Volvo with her face in her hands as if she were holding it on, and he wasn't sure how he felt about that. The assistant pastor in their parish was, parish was Father Jim Schwartz, he was handsome, humorous, in his late 20s, and all the schoolgirls got desperate and dreamy looks whenever he was around. Aiden's father said of his preaching that he really gets you thinking, but his tone was like that of a criticism. 
And Aiden's mother once joked that he was, Father, what a waste. Aiden misunderstood until she told him she meant it was a shame Father Schwartz could never marry. The good husbands, she said, are always taken. Aiden had never visited the old rectory. No one his age ever did. It was like tempting the porch of a haunted house. He was an altar boy, on, and one morning had to go to the kitchen door to get a cruet of wine from the old Belgian cook. And she'd seen the wide back of Monsignor Florio at the kitchen table, his black suit coat off, and his trousers held up by cross suspenders as he smeared jam on a slice of toast. Aiden was shocked by that secret look, his violation of the father's hard-won privacy, and the cook shooed him away as soon as she'd poured the red Cribari wine. And yet one afternoon after sixth grade basketball practice, his hair still wet and stiffening in the cold, Aiden went to the front door of the rectory and Father Schwartz himself answered the four-toned bell. With all his Roman collar and his sneakers and jeans and Creighton sweatshirt, Schwartz could have been the high school senior who coached them. Smiling as if he'd just heard a joke, Schwartz said, hi. With hesitation, Aiden asked, could I talk to you? Is this confessional matter? Aiden wasn't sure and said no. It's my day off, the assistant pastor said, but he invited him in. I'm trying to remember your name. Aiden Mannion. Oh, right. Let's go to the parlor. Aiden strode, a short strode jauntily to a hot, musty front room that was wallpapered in shades of lavender. I was congested with ornate furniture that seemed at least a century old. He fell nonchalantly into an overstuffed chair, and Aiden put his gym bag on the floor as he sat on the edge of a plush sofa cushion. Schwartz crossed his ankle-high black sneakers on an ottoman. You're a fifth grader, right? Sixth. Sister Josephina? Aiden nodded. So what's up? You knew my mom died? Oh, gosh, I forgot. I'm so, so sorry, Aiden. I was racking my brain. That's OK. Is this, that what this is about? She was really nice, Aiden said. She never did anything wrong. Sins of Aiden's own started vagrantly populating his thoughts. And you're wondering why she died? Sort of. The priest's right elbow was on the arm of the chair, and his right cheek was against his knuckles, as in a book jacket photograph illustrating wise consideration. The psalmist asked, asked it long ago, he said, why do the evil prosper? Why do the innocent suffer? Why, when a loved one is dying, doesn't God intercede? Those are philosophical questions, and they fall under the category called theodicy. I'm just 12, Aiden said. <laughs> Even in winter there, sunlight hurled itself through the southern windows and formed hatchings of shadow on the floor. Aiden's right shoe was untied, but he didn't fix it. Schwartz linked his fingers on top of his head. His hair was Christ long, the fashion then, and Aiden had heard older parishioners joke about it. Schwartz gazed outside at huddling girls, scuttling against the wind as he told the boy, there was an 18th century Scottish philosopher named David Hume who said that our experience of the world contradicted our conception of God because if God allowed evil to exist, he was not all good. Or if evil was loose in the world and God was unable to counteract it, he was not omnipotent. Evil, for Hume, demolished God, and he became an atheist. But he raises good questions, because sometimes it does seem God has lost interest in us. Children starve, wages rage on, illness goes the wrong way too often. I get a phone call, and a lady says she's gotten a death sentence from her doctor, and she cries, why me? I just look at Jesus hanging there on the crucifix and want to say, why not you? Are you following me? Sort of, Aiden said, even though he was lost. Each sentence seemed less like a window and more like a shutting door. We have to let God be God, the priest said. Con the conclusion felt overly routine. It's my day off, he'd said. But my sister and my dad and me, we ache. Schwartz's head jerked as if he'd been insulted. But his frown gradually soothed. Hey, I'm sorry, Aiden. I was off in systematic theology, and you're there with a cosmic knee in your gut. I'm no help at all, am I? 
You helped. Really? How? His question felt intentionally difficult and unfair, but his face was sincere. I guess just talking, Aiden said, hearing about other people. So you don't feel so alone, Schwartz said. Uh-huh. Are you feeling responsible that she died? Aiden felt accused. Why? Sometimes people do. Aiden gripped his gym bag and stood up. Is your mom still alive? Yes. Schwartz stood too, seemingly puzzled. Are we finished? I have a long walk home, and it's getting cold. Classes started again in January. Each week that year, the sixth graders had been visited by parents in differing occupations for their What I Want to Be project. And now Emmett Mannion was there to explain accounting, while Sister Josephina hunched at a back desk correcting their English homework. The clanging radiators in the old brick grade school were generally too hot in winter. And on that near zero afternoon, there was a kind of sauna in their second story classroom. Sister Josephina noticed aloud that the children were becoming dull. And Aiden's father opened the upper half of the four tall windows with a long hooked pole. Waterfalls of cold air poured in. Aiden's father returned to the accounting lesson chalking a ledger page on the blackboard and printing in capitals debits and credits. But then a sparrow flew in through one upper window opening, wildly looping around overhead like a frantic bat so that Aiden's classmates ducked down and covered their hair with their hands. One girl squealed and Sister Josephina held her textbook overhead and swatted at the bird, trying to shoo it toward the window opening. But still, the sparrow insanely circled and veered and swooped, hunting a way out, bashing into window panes, increasingly harassed and scared by every screech and waving arm. At last, Emmett Mannion told the class, let's try this, kids. Why don't we all quietly leave the room? And stirring over their heads at the thrashing bird, he held the door open in an official way as the class and Sister Josephina filed out. When the 30 of them were in the school hallway, Aiden's father let him and a few others look through the window in the classroom door. Aiden watched the sparrow flapping its wings in a panicky swirl. But as quiet took over the room, the sparrow calmed and cruised the four corners of the classroom until it felt the chill from the foot-high opening in an upper window, and with a sudden swerve was flying into the immensity of outdoors. Emmett Dal Mannion said nothing as he softly stared out at nothing at all. But Sister Josephina smiled and said, let us resume. Aiden filed back inside with the others. His father never mentioned it, and Aiden didn't tell Lucy because he wanted it for himself. That feeling of friendship with the silence he had been hearing but had not understood. No. Oh, thank you. And this story is uh, from my earlier collection, Nebraska. It's reprinted here. There are uh, seven old stories and 12 new ones in this. Uh, this is called Nebraska. I got uh, the impulse for it. Um, pra Prairie Schooner, uh, Lincoln, wrote me. They knew I'd written a novel. And they said, have you written anything about Nebraska? I wrote back and said, of course. And I hadn't at all. So I just free associated about my backyard, about the small towns I've visited and so forth. And so I'd always envied the way poets could begin something and then say, and on the other hand, and move into something completely different. So this has got this is like lack of transitions uh, uh, intensified. Nebraska. The town is America's covenant, Denmark, Grange, Hooray, Jerusalem, Sweetwater. One of the lesser known moons of the Platte, conceived in sickness and misery by European pioneers who took the path of least resistance and put down roots in an emptiness like the one they kept secret in their youth. In Swedish and Danish and German and Polish, in anxiety and fury in God's providence, they chopped at the Great Plains with spades 
creating green sod houses that crumbled and collapsed in the rain and disappeared in the first persuasive snow. It were so low the grown-ups stooped to go inside. And yet were places of ownership and a hard kind of happiness. The places their occupants gravely stood before on those plenary occasions when photographs were taken. And then the Union Pacific stopped by, just a camp of white campaign tents and a boy playing his harpoon at night. And then a supply store, a depot, a pine water tank, stockyards, and the mean prosperity of the 20th century. The trains strolling into town to shed a boxcar in the depot side yard, or crying past at 60 miles per hour, possibly interrupting a girl in her high wire act, her arms looping up when she tips to one side, the rail top as slippery as a silver spoon. And then the yellow and red locomotive rises up from the heat shimmer over a mile away, the August noonday warping the side of it, but cinders tapping away from the spikes and the iron rains, rails already vibrating up inside the girl's shoes. She snaps, steps down to the roadbed and then to high weeds as the Union Pacific pulls Wyoming coal and Georgia Pacific lumber and snowplow blades and the slant Japanese pickup trucks through the open countryside and on to Omaha. And when it passes by, a worker she knows is opposite her like a pedestrian at a stoplight, the sun not letting up, the plain song of grasshoppers going on and on between them until the worker says, hot. Twice the Union Pacific tracks cross over the side-winding Democrat, the water slow as an ox cart, green as silage, croplands to the east, yards and houses to the west, a green ceiling of leaves in some places, whirlpools showing up in it like spinning plates that lose speed and disappear. In winter, in a week or more of just above zero, high school couples walk the gray ice, kicking up snow as quiet words are passed between them, opinions are mildly compromised, sorrows are apportioned. And Emil Jedlicka unslings his blue stock 22 and slogs through high brown weeds and snow, hunting ringneck pheasant, sidelong rabbits, and always suddenly quail, as his little brother Orrin sprints across the Democrat in order to slide like an otter. July in town is a gray highway and a Ford hay truck spraying by, the hay sailing like a yellow ribbon caught in the mouth of, mouth of a prancing dog. And Billy Ewalt up there on the camel's hump, 18 years old and sweaty and dirty, peppered and dappled with hay dust, a lump of chew like an extra thumb under his lower lip, his blue eyes happening on a dairy queen and a pretty girl licking a pale trickle of ice cream from the cone. And Billy slaps his heart and cries, oh, I am pierced. And late October is orange on the ground and blue overhead and grain silos stacked up like white poker chips and a high silver water tower belittled one night by the sloppy tattoo of one year's class at George W. Norris High. And below the silos and water tower are stripped treetops, their gray limbs still lifted up in hallelujah, their yellow leaves crowding along yard fences and sheeping along the sidewalks and alleys under the shepherding wind. Or July, no, or January, and a heavy snow partitioning the landscape widening out the hallways and woods and cattle lots until there are only open spaces and steamed up window panes, and a Nordstrom boy limping pitifully in the hard plaster of his clothes, the snow as deep as his hips when the boy tips over and cannot get up, until a little Schumacher girl sitting by the stoop window, a spoon in her mouth, a bowl of Cheerios in her lap, says in plain voice, there's a boy, and her mother looks out to the sidewalk. Houses are big and white and two stories high, each a cousin to the next, with pigeon roosts in the attic gables, green storm windows on the upper floor, and a green screened porch, some as pillowed and couched as parlors, or made into sleeping rooms for the boy whose next step will be the Navy, and days spent on a ship with his hometown's own population, on gray water that rises up and is allayed like a geography of cornfields, sugar beets, soybeans, wheat that stays there and says in its own way, stay. Houses are turned away from the land and toward whatever is not always. 
sitting across from each other like dressed up children at a party in daylight, their parents looking on with hopes and fond expectations. Overgrown elm and sycamore trees poach the sunlight from the lawns and keep petticoats of snow around them into April. In the deep lots out back are wired clotheslines with flapping white sheets pinned to them. Property lines are hedged with sour green and purple grapes or with rabbit wire in gardens of peonies, roses, gladiola, irises, marigolds, pansies. Fruit trees are so closely planted that they cannot sway without knitting. The apples and cherries drop and sweetly decompo decompose until there are only slight brown bumps in the yards. But the pears stay up in the wind, drooping under the pecks of birds, withering down like peppers until their sorrow is justly noticed and they one day disappear. Aligned against an alley of blue shale rock is a garage whose doors slash weeds and scrape up pebbles as an old man pokily swings them open, teetering with his last weak push. And then Victor Johnson rummages inside, being cautious about his gray sweater and high top shoes, looking over paint cans, junked electric motors, grass rakes and garden rakes and a pitchfork and sickles, gray doors and ladders piled overhead in the rafters, and an old wind-up Victrola and heavy platter records from the 20s, on one of them a soprano singing, I'm a lonesome melody. Under a green tarpaulin is a wooden movie projector he painted silver and big, big cans of tan celluloid, much of it orange and, orange and green with age, but one strip of it preserved, of an army pilot in Jodhpur's hopping from one biplane onto another's upper wing. Country people who'd spayed, paid to see the movie had been spellbound by the, sight of, by the slight dip of the wings at the pilot's jump, the slap of his leather jacket, and how his hair trailed white strayed wild and was promptly sleeked back by the wind. But looking at the strip now, pulling a ribbon of it up to the window pane and letting it in spool to the ground, Victor can make out only 20 frames of the leap and then snapshot after snapshot of an army pilot clinging to the biplane's wing. And yet Victor stays with it as though that scene of one man staying alive were what he'd paid his nickel for. Main Street is just a block away. Pickup trucks stop in it so their drivers can angle out over their brown left arms and speak about crops or praise the weather or make up sentences whose only real point is their lack of complication. And then a cattle truck comes by and they mosey along with a touch of their cat bills or a slap of the door metal. High school girls in skin tight jeans stay in one place on weekends and jacked up cars cruise past rowdy farm boys overlapping inside, pulling over now and then in order to give the girls cigarettes and sips of pop and grief about their lipstick. And when the cars peel out, the girls say how a particular boy measured up, or they swap gossip about Donna Moriarty and the scope she permitted Randy when he came back from boot camp. Everyone is famous in this town, and everyone is necessary. Townspeople go to the Vaughn grocery store for the daily news, and to the home restaurant for history class, especially at Evensong when the old people eat graveled pot roast and lemon meringue pie and calmly sip coffee from cups that they tip to their mouths with both hands. The Kiwanis Club meets here on Tuesday nights, and hopes are made public, petty sins are tidily dispatched. The proceeds from the gumball machines are tallied up and poured into the upkeep of a playground. Utzler's hardware has picnic items and kitchen appliances in its one window in the manner of those prosperous men who prefer to be known for their hobbies. And there is one crisp white Protestant church with a steeple of the sort pictured on calendars and the Immaculate, the immaculate Conception Catholic Church grayly holding the town at bay like a Gothic wolfhound. And there is an insurance agency, a county coroner and justice of the peace, a second hand shop, a hire, handsome chiropractor named Cook who coaches the Pony League baseball team. A post office approached on unpainted wood steps outside of a cheap mobile home. The Nighthawk Tavern where there's Falstaff tap beer, a green pool table, a poster recording the Cornhusker scores, a crazy man patiently tolerated, a gray-haired woman with an unmoored eye, 
a boy in spectacles thick as paperweights, a carpenter pissing, missing one index finger, a plump waitress whose day job is in a basement beauty shop, an old woman who creeps up to the side door at eight in order to pur purchase one shot glass of whiskey. And yet passing by and paying attention, an outsider, outsider is only aware of what isn't, that there's no bookshop, no picture show, no pharmacy or dry cleaners, no cocktail parties, extreme opinions, jewelry or piano stores, motels, hotels, hospital, political headquarters, philosophical theories about being and the soul. High importance is only attached to practicalities. And so there is the bachelor funeral home where a proud old gentleman is on display in a dark brown suit, his yellow fingernails finally clean, his smeared eyeglasses in his coat pocket, a grandchild in tiptoes by the casket, peering at the lips that will not move, the sparrow chest that will not rise. And there's Tommy Seymour's for Sinclair gasoline and mechanical repairs, a green balloon dinosaur bobbing from a string over the cash register. Old, old tires piled beneath the cottonwood, for sale in the side yard, a case tractor, a John Deere Reaper, a hay mower, a red manure spreader, and a rusty crane conveyor, green weeds overcoming them, standing up inside them, trying slyly and little by little to inherit machinery for the earth. And beyond that are woods, a slope of pasture, six empty cattle pens, a driveway made of limestone pebbles, and the house where Alice Sorensen pages through a child's world book encyclopedia, stopping at the descriptions of California, Cape Town, Ceylon, Colorado, Copenhagen, Corpus Christi, Costa Rica, Cyprus. Widow Dwork has been watering the lawn in an open raincoat and apron, but at nine she walks the green hose around to the spigot and screws down the nozzles so that, so that the spray is a misty crystal bowl softly baptizing the ivy. She says, how about some chamomile tea? And she says, yum, oh boy, that hits the spot. And she bends to shut the water off. Union Pacific night train rolls through town just after 10 o'clock when a 60-year-old man named Adolf Schooley is a boy again in bed. And when the huge weight of 40 or 50 yard cars jostles his upstairs room like a motor he'd put a quarter in, and over the sighing industry of the train, you can hear the train saying, Nebraska, 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 Nebraska. And he cannot sleep. Mrs. Antoinette Heft is at the home restaurant, placing frozen meat patties on waxed paper, pausing at times to clamp her fingers under her arms and press the sting from them. She stops when the Union Pacific passes, then picks a cigarette out of a pack of cools and smokes it on the back porch, smelling air as crisp as oxidol, looking up at star stars the Pawnee Indians looked at, hearing the low harmonica of big rigs on the highway. In the town, she knows like the palm of her hand. In the country, she knows by heart. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I guess that was pretty wonderful. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, we have a few minutes for some questions and answers, and um, um, I'll take a seat over there in a second. In fact, I, want, I think they want you in the far seat. <laughs> um, we have a couple of microphones in the house, and uh, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please uh, wave to the helpful volunteer and they'll bring the microphone to you so you can be heard or just raise your hand. Um, I just want to say thank you again to Ron for, for being with us this evening. I'm going to start by asking a serious question and stop teasing you. Um, you know, uh, is, there, is, the, is there a way you would, you know, I, I hear that story in Nebraska and one of my favorite stories is wickedness, which also seems to me to capture the place. Uh, is there a, a Nebraska character that you can 
describe, and I don't mean a person, but so much as a, a, a nature. Here's what I'm remembering, and it came to me as I was hearing you read Nebraska. Um, that wonderful story, uh, Wickedness, and there's that moment, I can't remember his name, where the character has gone through a terrible, you know, uh, frozenness and uh, half, half dead as he staggers into his, his house and his wife helps him kind of thaw out. And the only words the, the man has to say is, that was different. Oh, that was not pleasant. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but it seems to me that there's something about the Nebraska character in that moment and in so much of this story. And I wondered if you could sum it up in some way. Well, I, I know that's, a, that's an impossible question. The, uh, the heritage is still that of um, frontiersmen and farmers and so forth, even now. And so I think that I would say one characteristic of Nebraskans is that they're realists. They have no wild expectations, no, you know, they're, they're grounded, I think. And they see things perfectly clearly and, and they'll talk to you tactlessly because they, they just think the straight poop is what you should have. Yeah. <laughs> that feels right, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, feel free to share a question with us if you've got one. You know, related to that question, I wanna ask, um, is there something about Nebraska that makes it such a fertile ground for writers and for artists and for filmmakers? I mean, there seem to be actors, there seem to be uh, more than our share of, of all of people in the arts. And I just wonder, you know, do you have a sense of why? Some of the people here probably remember Lee Lubers. Yeah. And I, I took art classes from him and I asked him why he liked to be in, in Nebraska. And he says, um, the Midwest gives you something to kick against. <laughs> and uh, because uh, I think artists are not revered, you have to be kind of an outlaw uh, to become one. And I think that uh, people respond in that way by seeking out the arts. But also I think that uh, the idea of rugged individualism is true and that's what artists need, that they don't always have a, a group to uh, hurry them forth. And also I, I like the idea of uh, being defensive about Nebraska because it's considered like nowhere land and the flyover state, you know. Most people talk about driving through Nebraska and kind of wait to get out of it. And they always talk about how flat it is, and I always have to disabuse them of the fight. That it's not flat at all, but the I-80 I is flat, but nothing else. As our, as our provost was saying, uh, who's a runner, uh, you run and you <laughs> notice it's not flat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to ask you a little bit about your work for a second. So much of the, of the novels especially are historical in basis, and impressively so. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your work process, because how, how do you marshal all of that data and yet, you know, turn it into a narrative that, you know, feels natural and seamless and not overburdened by fact? Right. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm literally wondering what your workspace looks like <laughs> yeah. under you know, all of that stuff. But, you know, when I was writing uh, Jesse James, I went down, about Jesse James, I went down to St. Joseph. Joseph, Missouri, and visited the little museum there. But I went to the house on Lafayette, uh, and I took a photograph of all the a panorama so I could see what Jesse James looked at. Um, but normally, I do not take notes. Um, I, I just read something and hope to absorb it. And that's how, it, then it comes out naturally. If you take notes, then you'll shoehorn it in there, yeah. and it'll become obvious. So uh, are you saying you don't have a, a, a word list or slang I, list? Or I do have that. You do yeah. have that. OK, yeah. OK. And I, one of the things that's always troubling to me is I'll write a word, and I'll say, did they have that back then? And I have to go look at the uh, partridge to see um, if the word actually existed. I'm sometimes surprised. Sometimes it's a 15th century word. I thought it seemed modern. but. It, but yeah, that's the kind of thing. Sometimes I, I cast the movie. Mm. Uh, that helps me to remember what people look like. Yeah. You know? So was Brad Pitt and, and Casey Affleck, were they in your head? No, no, no. I, I, when I first saw Brad Pitt, it was in Thelma and Louise, I thought he'd be a perfect Bob Ford. And then I had to wait some 30 years and he was finally perfect for Jesse James. Yeah. We have a question, yes. Yes, um, I have a question. Well, thank you so much for reading for us tonight first. Um, my question's kind of a simple one, but potentially a, a large one, I think. Um, I'm wondering, 
between um, novels and short stories, um, is there one that you prefer to write more than the other? Or, or potentially, is there one that you find more challenging than the other? Ah, well, everything's challenging. <laughs> uh, the novel, I, I compare to a long summer vacation and a short story as a party. Uh, so you get, get in and out and all these people for a little time. And, but otherwise, you know, with a novel, you have ups and downs. You know, you're cranky in one day, and that'll show through in what you write. And you're deliriously happy in another, and that'll show through. So there's more emotional range in a novel. So I think I actually prefer the novel. But no, stories are a nice break. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. I read in the uh, IMDb today that you spent a week on the set of the movie filming of the assassination of yeah. Jesse James by the Howard, Howard Robert Ford. Ford. <laughs> and allegedly the title of the movie was required to be the same from the book to the movie. And, and, and number one, is that true? And number two, yeah. give us some dishy gossip from when <laughs> you were on the set. Um, yeah. One, um, uh, the director is named Andrew Dominic. He's from New Zealand. He was in a Melbourne bookstore. And he has a son named Jesse. And he saw this used book uh, called this. And he's Jesse James. So he thought, I should read something about Jesse James. And so he opened it up. And it wasn't more than a couple pages. But we thought, this, is, this would make a good movie. And it just so happened he'd finished a movie called Chopper. And Brad Pitt had called him and said, I'd like to work on a film with you someday. And uh, he said, have I got the book for you? And he sent a copy of uh, the assassination of Jesse James to him. And Brad read it and liked it. Then he gave it to Angelina Jolie. And she really liked it and said, you have to do this movie. Um, and he felt such um, fidelity to the material that he had it written in his contract that they could not change the title. So that's why he did it. And he made no money whatsoever on the, the movie. But he still talks about it as his favorite film. Um, but I, I was on the set, and I got to talk to Brad quite a bit because, as the writer, you have nothing to do on a film set, and the actor is just <laughs> cooling his hills, you know, waiting for a scene. And uh, so I got to talk. He, was, he just struck me as one of the most gracious, kindest men I've ever met. And uh, he would finish a scene. It was what was interesting to see the different coloration he could give to every line reading. You know, he'd be doing some passage, and sometimes it'd be really emotional, sometimes it'd be really flat. And he was just trying to play with all those things. And then um, he'd walk off the set, and I said, boy, you did a great job there, Brad. And he says, you wrote the material. <laughs> <laughs> nice. that, Casey Affleck, I was, he was there, and hit, this was his first well-known film. And I was once walking him home after uh, uh, recording all day, and I said, you did really good work there, Casey. And he says, Oh, Ron, every time I finish a scene, I feel like a failure. And once I went to see Jeff Bridges, I was just telling my sister this, that I was coaching him about the Jesuits. He was going to do a movie about the Jesuits. I had no idea what it was about. My wife was with me, and I was giving him all background on the Jesuits. And then he says, are you a Jesuit? I said, that's a crucial thing. Jesuits don't have wives. <laughs> but one thing Jeff Bridges said is every time he finishes a movie, he thinks of himself as a failure, and he wonders if he's ever going to do a movie again. And he's done such brilliant stuff. We were there. There was a script uh, for, it was the Cider House, or, no, uh, Son of the Circus by John Irving. And after a while, he said, uh, why don't we read a seed together? And so he gave me one character and he did another. And he had just finished doing The Big Lebowski, so he was kind of burly and long, shaggy hair and all that stuff. And, but Bo was watching, I was reading the script, and Bo was watching, he said, she said, suddenly as he started acting, he became Jeff Bridges. Um, but I thought that was interesting, Casey and Jeff feel like failures. And I was saying at dinner, every time I finish a novel, I feel like another failure. And, so I, and I'm really neurotic, and so I have to depend on my agent to sell it, because if I presented it, I'd say, oh, you're right, you shouldn't take this one. <laughs> Actors tell a story about Laurence Olivier, some incredible performance of Shakespeare, and all of his friends went backstage to congratulate him. It was by far the greatest performance they had ever seen, and they found him in tears in his uh, dressing room. 
And I said, what's the matter? You know, it was great. It was wonderful. And he said, I know, but I don't know why it was wonderful. <laughs> you know? That is great. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite lines of Lawrence Olivier's is somebody who came up and said, do you think I should be an actor? And he said, if anything can keep you from acting, let it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I say that to people asking about writing. If anything can keep you from writing, let it. Um, what you're speaking of, uh, uh, oh, there's a question. It's Father Joe. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi, Joe. Um, thank you, Ron, for being here. I'm a Jesuit. I don't have a wife. Um, <laughs> I, I had uh, one question. Who do you read uh, to inspire you as a writer besides Dr. Spencer? Um, <laughs> if you could share about that. Well, I've, been, I've talked about my uh, devotion to John Updike, who is the person who made me want to become a writer. I loved Edgar Allan Poe when I was growing up, but I still go back to his things. Um, geez, there's so many. I read a lot of po poets, and I look for things I can steal. Uh, my niece, Rebecca Rodert, has a novel coming out in June. It's absolutely wonderful. It's called Last Night at the Blue Angel, so I think you should all buy a copy, <laughs> if not two. Um. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's hard. One, once a woman asked me, did I have um, any favorite books? And I said, oh, there are too many to mention. And she says, oh, you don't have any at all? I said, that's exactly <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you learn from every a Tolstoy I learned from. Um, they're, they're, and I, I quote Shakespeare in virtually every novel I've written, uh, steal a line from him. And I quote Hopkins a lot in my stuff. Uh, so, yeah, there's lots of influences. Um, I'm very sort of along these same lines. I'm curious to hear uh, your impressions of another contemporary author who um, seems to maybe share superficially many of the same thematic concerns as you um, Cormac McCarthy, oh, yeah. uh, when we're speaking about, you know, frontiersmen's gunslingers and farmers, but whose work I think, it, maybe the spirit of his work, I find very, very different from yours. Um, so I'm just curious to hear your impressions of him. Um, I actually played 36 holes of golf in one day with Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just about the time of All the Pretty Horses was going to be, was coming out as a movie. And he hadn't even read the script. He had nothing to do with it. So it was exactly the opposite of what my, my feelings are about film. But after finally around hole 34, <laughs> I said, Cormac, would you ever consider coming to Santa Clara to give a reading? He says, Ron, I'm as likely to do that as dance in the ballet. <laughs> 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 and, but I realized that this is a guy who just kind of holes up in an El Paso motel and writes and just doesn't deal with all this stuff. And so whenever I'm thinking, should I get onto Twitter or Facebook, I think, what would Cormac McCarthy do? <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I'm not on Twitter. But he has, yeah. a, has a, a new movie out that yeah, he has counselor. written. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, he actually began his first novel he wrote as a screenplay. It, it was filmed, yeah. But, uh, He's no really nice guy. His, father, his, his brother is an electrical engineer for the Tennessee Valley Authority. And he just seemed like such a normal guy when he was around his brother. Yeah. You're always ex surprised when writers are normal, because <laughs> often they aren't. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about the new book you're working on, or is that, uh, I don't want to well, put you on the I'll spot. Well, I'll just say very vaguely, mm -hmm. I hope to work on a book that <laughs> is set in Omaha uh, during my 15th year when I worked uh, at Miller Park Golf Course. And, uh, so it unites my love of writing with my love of golf. <laughs> yes, there's one here. Two questions. Uh, when you write a, a uh, Bell of Amherst, you know, she says, there's that word you can take your hat off to. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you ever, when you write, just kind of lean back and say, that's a good one? Yeah. And, yeah. and um, so how do you, how do you, do you picture words or hear them or look at them? The oh. second question is, what, how much and how did you do the research for uh, Marriott and Ecstasy? Because it's, it's it's not an Omaha book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to. What did I, you what I, did you do for that? I was living in upstate New York at the time when I was writing most of that, and it was, I just set it in upstate New York because it was easier to look out the window and see what the weather was like. Um, I 
hung out, hung out the BX section of the Santa Clara Library. BX is all about religious orders. So I, I learned all about the rules, uh, looked up to see if there was a name of a group, uh, Sisters of the Crucifixion, and there wasn't. And uh, um, I was taking a theology class at the time, a Christology class. And once when I was in the Christology class, the guy was talking about a young woman who was a Jesuit was teaching, and she was coming to him for spiritual direction because she was trying to decide whether to become a Carmelite nun or get married. And she'd been praying about it for months and didn't get a firm decision about it. And the guy said, maybe what God is saying is surprise me. And that I, as soon as I heard that, I knew it was my, the final line of the book. And so little things like little occurrences or coincidences came up during the writing that helped me develop her character. Yeah. How about the words? Oh, the words. I, whenever I write a sentence, I'm also looking at the thesaurus, looking for just the right words. And from the thesaurus, I look at etymologies to see what the real proper word would be. So I use that all the time. And that, as far as sentences, every once in a while, a, sentence comes around where I feel like that dog in Peanuts who runs around with gluey, Snoopy, you know. Oh, how wonderful. Um, and every once in a while, uh, I, I've been giving readings at bookstores and so forth, and a woman said, would you please read the sentence on page 208 in the first paragraph? And I, I read it with such glee because it's exactly what, I, she thought it was an amazing sentence, and I thought it was an amazing sentence when I wrote it. Uh, but so. Yeah, I, I think the love of language, language is what keeps people going as writers. Uh, story is wonderful and uh, characterizations are important, but you, unless you actually love writing sentences, you can't continue as a writer. Finding that right word. Those words in your work always feel to me like they're physical, that, you, that they've been picked, you know, like Hemingway talks about picking up that pebble from the bottom of a stream bed. Right, yeah. I feel that way. Well, thank you. Yes. We see um, Ron Hansen, the grown man, the author. <laughs> Not so and grown. I'm an edu <laughs> well, frolicky and happy, yes, love of words. But um, being a teacher of young children, I'm curious to know, what were you like as a child? Were you a lover of words? Yeah. Were you prolific in your writing? Or have you grown what? into who that is? who you are and, and what you're providing for us this evening. One of my earliest memories was in kindergarten where a person talked about going to a church and when you put on the kneeler, some red lights went on like to convey blood. And so it was kind of a show and tell thing and this kindergarten teacher came to me and said, uh, have you done anything recently? I said, yeah, I went to this church and I was, sat, I was on a kneeler and blood came down. And the boy who told me this was kind of awestruck because I was telling such a better story than he'd given me. <laughs> and that, that I'd been secretive about going to the same place he was. And then I could see Sister, I think it might have been Sister Josephina, kind of smiling at the, a child's imagination. And I kept getting encouragement in that way. I, I wrote a story, I wrote an essay once about St. Luke. And I talked about how in kindergarten, we were doing a Christmas pageant, and all these people were assigned roles. But because uh, I have a twin brother, she forgot me. And so I went to, at uh, recess, I went up to her in, with fear and trembling, because I thought I'd been flunking out of kindergarten or something. And I said, you didn't give me any part. And she looked at me and says, well, you can be, uh, we need a narrator. You can be St. Luke. And so, because I, I didn't know how to read yet, my mom sat with me in the dining room and read the Chris the nativity passage from St. Luke. And I memorized all this stuff, not knowing what the words meant, like swaddling clothes and manger, things like that. And there I stood in front of all these adults and I started reciting the words of St. Luke. And I was aware that all these adults were paying attention to me. And so I learned the power of language and, and of storytelling right there. And those are two crucial moments in my life. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, um, I'm an aspiring writer myself, and uh, if I could do one thing for a living, it would be to write, and uh, it really gives me inspiration. A lot of times, I think, when we write, we uh, write for ourselves. What was the first time, when was the first time you wrote for yourself, and you were just like, this is going somewhere, you know, this is, this is something great? I, yeah, I, I wrote 
for myself, but I, I, when I was here, I was working on Shadows Magazine, and every issue they didn't have, we didn't have enough stories submitted, so I put one of my stories in there <laughs> each time. <laughs> I tried out my pseudonym all the way through. It was Ronald T. Hansen, then R. T. Hansen, and Ron Hansen, but it, it's kind of interesting. And I, well, there was one guy in, uh, the, who wrote a review in the Cratonian. That was my first negative review. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I think there came a time when I was at Iowa where I su it suddenly became clear how to write a story that somebody would want to publish. And it's, it's, it's kind of an amorphous, mystifying thing, but I thought from that point on, if I really liked a story, I could get it published somewhere. And up until then, it seemed like a mystery. Why did they accept this, not, not this? Um, but, and it was just the practice of writing itself that did that for me. It wasn't that I learned anything at Iowa. It was just that Iowa provides you like a two-year sanctuary in which to write. And it's the writing itself and the imitation of other writers that makes you learn. And that's how you really imitating other writers, which seem to make you parrot them, but in fact it helps you to find your own voice because you see how master is doing. I used to diagram stories uh, just to see how the writer made one move to another and then another. Um, so, and I think uh, Brent would probably agree, although we both teach creative writing, a real writer teaches him or herself. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Good. You know, that, that, that's a good trigger for the question I wanted to ask. Um, and I know it's an old chestnut, but it's, a, it's an important one. Uh, we have people in the room who are young writers, people who are not so young, who might have spent a lifetime doing something quite different, and who suddenly think, uh, you know, I, I might try to write a novel, uh, that kind of thing. What kind of advice can, can you give them? I know, you know, it's impossible to answer that question, but uh, is there something you can tell? I think the, the, that Nike expression, just do it. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes there was a guy I used to play tennis with in Iowa City, he was a doctor. He wrote 13 novels before he had one accepted. Um, so, but he didn't revise at all. That was one of his problems. But, uh, <laughs> but there's something to be said for just going forward. Yeah, and yeah. Especially when you realize what you've read, written is dreck. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, over here. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, so my question is: Do you think that fiction always needs to have an aspect that is inexplicable or transcendent? And I'm asking this question after having just read The Assassination of Jesse James. And what I thought was interesting about that story was that on one level you seem to demythologize Jesse James, um, especially as he's been portrayed as a Robin Hood type figure in dime novels. But then on another aspect, um, you seem to imbue him with a sixth sense or something very mysterious. So. Very perceptive. Thank you. <laughs> No, I, I would say it, it's, it's great when there is uh, attention to the transcendent in novels, but it doesn't happen all that often, as you know. Uh, so many people are kind of irreligious. Um, and they're so focused on themselves, they can't see the bigger picture. I always say that a person, uh, a, a novelist who writes about the supernatural, the transcendent, is like a person who sees in color versus the people who see in black and white, that there's more out there. Um, and I, th I think it rewards people to have that. I think Tolstoy certainly had that in his life, um, and that's why his novels are still so powerful, because you deal with real people and real dilemmas, and with the recognition that these people have souls, not just bodies and minds. Does that answer? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let me... Uh close if I don't see another question. Oh, yes, there's one. Okay, yes. Yeah, Here comes uh, the microphone. When you wrote the Marietta and Ecstasy, did yeah. your twin brother have any input on that uh, novel? No. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember him doing that. Um, my sister was a Dominican nun at one time, and I learned what life is like in a convent because of her. Um, my brother is uh, one of my biggest fans, and I always show him my stuff. Um, but I don't remember him ever contributing. Has he told you that he has? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had the 
experience. I was in Milwaukee. I was walking across the floor, and I, I approached a man and using uh, clerical. He turned around and said, Ron, I, I didn't know you had a twin brother. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I walked and read Mary Max's. Oh, thank you. I just wondered if his own experiences had. Well, I'm sure you did. everything matters to a writer. You know, it all glues to you in some way. And you find a way to pick off the strands that are important. Uh, so there could have been things that he said uh, that were influencing how I treated the material. We're not entirely sure that we have Ron here. <laughs> it may be Ron, the brother. <laughs> Let me close, if I may, uh, First, before I forget, to uh, thank the students who are helping out with our event this afternoon and tonight, and, and once again to thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, and I should mention, too, that the Creighton Alumni Book Club will be reading and discussing Ron's novel Atticus uh, beginning in January. Uh, Sign-up sheets uh, for this book club are also available in the foyer where you'll uh, also find copies of the brochure describing Creighton's <laughs> brand new Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. So again, thank you all for coming. This has been wonderful. Thanks.